Hello everyone. Uh, I believe we're now live and welcome to this uh, episode 18 of the series of online events organized by FIP called Responding to the Pandemic Together uh, with, in, in reference to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, of course. And today we will be focusing on Good Pharmacy Practice or GPP. Um, and we will have uh, the privilege of listening to a presentation by the FIP Vice President Eva Tirisalmi from Finland. Uh, Eva has been instrumental in, in developing many of the GPP documents and in their implementation at country level in several parts of the world. So it's really uh, a, an incredible insight into GPP and developing uh, practice standards for pharmacy and quality standards for pharmacy services and how these uh, quality standards can help us in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic from a community pharmacy perspective. So just to give you a little bit of background, uh, well, my name is Gonzalo Souza Pinto. I'm FIP Lead for Practice Development and Transformation. It is my pleasure and privilege to be the facilitator for today's uh, webinar. Um, a few announcements and house rules. So the, the webinar is being recorded and it will become freely available at our dedicated coronavirus webpage, so www.fip.org slash coronavirus. Uh, this will be open not only to individual members of FIP, but to everyone, uh, which is a special uh, situation for the, all the COVID-19 uh, webinars and, and online events. Uh, you're very welcome to ask any questions. We will have some time at the end after Eva's presentation. So please do use the questions tool to, to type any questions you may have. And, and of course, you're also welcome to send any feedback about the webinar to uh, webinars at fip.org. Um, also, please note that the information in this video is or this webinar is confidential and cannot be copied, downloaded, or reproduced without approval from FIP. Uh, our learning objectives for today is to understand the roles of pharmacists, but also national pharmaceutical organizations and healthcare, team, uh, healthcare systems in developing good pharmacy practice standards. Also to understand the role that we as pharmacists can take as part of a healthcare team and what are the requirements uh, of this role but also to understand the methodology and the principles of quality management in community pharmacy and to be able to set standards, measure the quality and use the principles of continual improvement in one's own working environment. And before I introduce uh, Eva in, in a bit more detail, uh, I would just like to give you a bit of background on where this GPP comes from in, in FIP circles. It goes back a number of years, actually it goes back to the mid 80s or 90s when the WHO organized uh, several meetings in, in Delhi in India and then in Tokyo in Japan in 1993, first in 88, then in 93, um, as part of their revised drug strategy and to discuss what could be or what should be the role of pharmacists as part of uh, their revised drug strategies. And this led to uh, FIP developing standards, the first, the first documents, the first GPP standards were developed by FIP in 1992. And since then there have been several updates and several other documents. Um, and the last one, I mean, the, I won't go through the, all the versions and all the updates that were produced uh, since 92, of course, but I would just like to highlight that the, the last time that FIP and WHO jointly agreed on these standards of practice for community pharmacists was in 2011, which is the version that is still valid and that we are basing our uh, webinars today on. Um, Eva is a, I will now move on to the following slide to introduce Eva. Uh, um, Eva Teresalmi is vice president of FIP she graduated from the Helsinki University as Masters of Pharmacy in 1982. Uh, her interests have always been in the field of managing change of the pharmacy profession from the traditional, more dispensing role to a public health supporter role. So more focused on professional services by community pharmacists. And for this, 
the continuing education, service development and research on managing change have been her main interest areas in her professional life. This has happened at the local, national and international level where pharmacists' role in promoting uh, public health has been defined. Um, Eva is uh, connecting from Helsinki, from Finland, so I will now give the floor to her who has the real expertise here so that she can uh, present her, her slides. Welcome, Eva, and thank you very much. Thank you, Gonzo. Uh, and I, let's start the, the uh, a discussion today about the good pharmacy practice. And I, as Gonzo also mentioned, so the good pharmacy practice document, uh, as it is now, states from the 211, and a, uh, the definition by FIP and WHO, so this is a joint uh, um, uh, document, says that good pharmacy practice is the practice of pharmacy that responds to the needs of the people who use the pharmacist services to provide optimal and evidence-based care. So here are some key words which I have made in uh, red and, and uh, I will discuss this a little bit later uh, more. And the other sentence which is uh, of importance here is that to support this practice, it is essential that there be an established national framework of quality standards and guidelines. So what is said here is that they, we understand that this is quality work and, they, and they, it makes it easier to accept these quality standards if they are something which comes from the national level. But they, I will back, come back to this in the, in the uh, later uh, slides. Next slide, please. Doesn't change. Thank you. So, as I said, there are the key elements of good pharmacy practice, what makes it good instead of just practice as normal. So, the, the pharmacy practice, when it, when it becomes the good pharmacy practice, is based on the needs analysis of those we are serving. And those we are serving can be our our customers or they can be the society in general because the society in normal ways is the one who sets the, the goals for the pharmacy services, what, what, what is needed. And all those services we, we do uh, give to these uh, customers should be described and then standardized so that we really know that those services we do have met the goals which there are and the services should also be based on evidence and knowledge. So there is not service as such, but, but it's based on, on some understanding of what kind of a, uh, um, goals it will fulfill. And in this way, we will have the quality of services which is guaranteed. And a, uh, of course, when we think about this first thing, the needs analysis, so um, it's much easier if these specific needs from pharmacy side are uh, written in the national regulation and rules. So it, it's a, it's kind of, then we know what is expected from us by the society, but they, uh, even if we are working in the circumstances where we do not have this support from the society, it's totally possible to work in your own uh, pharmacy based on the quality management system. And, and then it only means that you are all the time aware of what, is, uh, what, what are your services, how is it organized, what the staff is expected to do, etc., etc. So uh, this is a, a double-faced thing in, in that way. So no, no, uh, it doesn't become impossible if you don't have the support from your, from your regulation, but it makes it, of course, much easier. Uh, so, when you combine the role of the pharmacist and the quality thinking, uh, then the pharmacy practice, as practice as, as usual, becomes good pharmacy practice. And this is the same principle which we can also see when we speak about the other good practices, like good manufacturing practice or good laboratory practices or good hospital practice. So, the idea is that the quality aspect is added to the to the work and in that way you get it uh, something which is called good and a as i already said 
for when we talk about the pharmacy services, they should be based on the needs of the societies, or if you don't have this societal aspect here, then on the based on your own customers, your own patients you are serving. And all the processes in which you produce the services, they should be described and they should be based, of course, on your strategy of the pharmacy and, and, and all the pharmacies. So a, there is nothing which happens only by accidentally in, in your pharmacy, but you have processes and then you describe these processes, how you, how you bring the services. And there's then a, that, that means that it's, it's a going every time in the same way. And these processes then could be evaluated, they could be measured and they could be improved. And that's something which is called a continual improvement, which is an, uh, uh, next slide please, uh, important thing here. So we call about the Deming cycle, which you see in this say, slide. So when you talk about the quality management of services, so it's a systematic approach to describe both the processes and the outcomes. And you have here four different elements, which I've uh, had a mentioned here many times already. So you have the process thinking, you have the focus on the customer needs, you have the idea of continual improvement, which means that you try to get your processes being more smooth, producing better outcomes, etc., uh, all the time. And to be able to do that, you have to have the measurable outcomes. And a, this is a described in this Deming cycle, where you can see it starts from this planning phase. You plan your process, then you do it, and then you check whether everything was going in the way you want to, it, it to, to do. And then you make the corrections and then you start a new cycle. So that's the, um, and, and in this picture it looks easy, but, that, but it is in, in uh, the, the basis for the, for the whole, whole thinking. So uh, if we look at the societal level, so what we can see is the whole idea of this quality management is that you come from chaos where things just happened to organizing your services. And uh, if we think about all these three elements, the pharmacist, the patient and the society. So uh, I have tried to link these three things here in this uh, picture. So if we start from the society, the society in a way is the one who makes together with the pharmacist the needs assessment. The, the society sets the, what are the needs, what are the expectations towards pharmacists? Do we just want them to, to, to be a pay places where people can buy medicines? Do we expect them to be places where they get their vaccinations, for example, or where they get pharmaceutical care or whatever? So that's the, that's the, the needs assessment. And with the regulation, then the society puts on place the possibilities for the pharmacist to fulfill these needs, uh, what, what, uh, what there are in the society. And the pharmacist in, in his or her work guarantees the quality of those services with these quality standards and, a, and the quality management of the services. And with that qualified way, the pharmacist then promises to the patient that there will be a successful therapy, sorry, uh, back please. Uh, there will be a successful therapy because the patient gets the standardized a, a service and then we know that with this service, the, the therapy will be more successful than, than without this kind of a, of a management. And the society on, on with this regulation guarantees to the patient the accessibility and affordability of the pharmacy services. So this is a, a, a system where everybody benefits from this a, uh, organized way of, of working. And now we can look at the pharmacy process chart. And the next slide, thank you. Uh, here you see a typical process chart, what we mean with the processes and describing the processes. So above everything, you have the planning and development uh, process of the pharmacy. And on the left side, you see the, the, the C here means customer needs. 
So you have the needs analysis. And in the end of this slide, in the, in the right, you see the satisfied customer. So that's our goal. And uh, in this case, in this pharmacy, uh, we have two main processes. The other one is the process how to serve the customers who physically enter the pharmacy. And on this other one, you have the distant customers. So those people who do not physically enter the pharmacy, how do we serve them? And then you have the, uh, the supporting services. In this case, there are eight of them. One is logistics, the other one is economics. Then you have IT, you have compounding, you have cleaning, which in the case of the COVID is very important. You have the personal administration, you have the marketing plan, and you have the data protection. And they, uh, with uh, help of all these supporting processes, these main processes are running in the pharmacy. And then you have the results of the processes, which you can then measure. And then you have a system where you can um, see the results of these, these things. And in the second, uh, next uh, slide, you see uh, how you control this system. So you can annually or, or more often if you want, you, you are doing audits uh, on, the, on the whole system. And, and all these processes are audited annually by the person who is called the process owner, who is the pharmacist running this process, and then somebody who is the auditor, who is normally the person who is not responsible on the, on the real process. And they go through all those steps which you have described in your standard operational procedure, and you see whether it's really done according to those uh, plans or whether there needs to be something to be changed or whatever. And you collect all these say, results to your to your uh, whatever balance scorecard or what kind of measurement unit you are using. And then you do the, the changes, you, you, you use the Demings circle to get it a, a run more smoothly. So uh, these are the general principles of the, of the quality management. And now I think it's try, time to one poll. Indeed. So, um, if you can please respond to the question that uh, is has just popped up on your screen, and we will get the immediate responses to this before we continue with the presentation. So, is the question is is GPP a as a concept familiar to you? Are you familiar with the standards that Eva has been describing? Okay, thank you very much. So we have the results. So a vast majority, 80% of attendees were already familiar with the GPP, which is a great sign, I think. Um, and we will have a second question now. And here it is. And have you adopted any of the GPP principles and adapted them to your pharmacy, so to your specific pra uh, pharmacy practice? So on a scale from one to five, where one means, no, I have not implemented them or adapted them at all, to five, I have fully adopted an, an accredited system for of good pharmacy practice. Um, where would you... Um, place your level of implementation of GPP. A few more seconds. Okay, so the results are here a bit across all levels, uh, but the majority of our attendees are 
at level four, let's say, have, they have implemented, maybe not fully implemented uh, an accredited system of GPP, but they have implemented to some extent the, the GPP standards and very followed very closely by 0.3. So I would say the majority of people, around 60% are between three and four, which is not bad, but I will leave the, the comments to, to Ava, of course. It's, I think it's a good result. Yes. Ava, back, back to you. Thank you. I think it's a marvelous result. So a very good, thank you. Uh, and we have a comment here also. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, now when we have the background clear, uh, we will look what uh, benefits you get if you have the, the quality management also during the time of crisis and your GPP is on place. We have a saying in Finland, at least, that they well planned is half done. And they, here it really means that they, you've done your risk analysis. And they, in case of, of all kind of, of crises, uh, and, and even in the normal times. So nowadays, the quality management systems also have this part, part of quality management, uh, of risk analysis, which means that in every process, you also think that what could happen, what could go wrong, what, what, what are the, uh, the, the risk factors in my process? So for example, for my customer service, what could go wrong? And for example, with this seminar, if I, if I drop down from the connection, so what can I do? And a, uh, nowadays the risk analysis is also a, a really an official part of the ISO standards if you want to standardize your or accredit your system. And a, you also can a, look at this risk analysis on, from the point of view of your strategy. So what is our role and what are the expectations towards us and how can we in the pharmacy level best benefit the, the, the whole system and, a, and see what we can do in the case of a, a time of the crisis. And a place on this risk uh, or, or an, uh, on those risk analysis, you tend then have to do the contingency plans. And a, in, in our case here in Finland, we do have even in during the normal times, we have a national contingency plan for the for the risk risks uh, or the different kind of crises, and uh, we also have those in uh, in the local level, uh, and both in the healthcare and also in the pharmacy level. And these contingency plans are not worth of anything if you don't update them regularly, so because the the things are changing, the world is changing, and you have a new kind of of risks. Etc. But they, this is how you you manage with the with the risk analysis and and contingency plans, updated them regularly, discussing the possible problems, and this of course keeps you alerted a little bit, so that you don't think that okay everything is going like yesterday, and we will continue forever with this, but you are aware that something can happen, unexpectedly, unwanted, but anyway it can happen. So if we look then to the GPP in COVID-19, um, uh, we can see that they, the expectations uh, towards pharmacies uh, were that they, there are the safe procurement processes. And they, uh, this is very important if we think about the pharmacy level because uh, during the, the crisis time, all kind of fiddles and, and a, uh, companies trying to, to, to tell, sell you the things you don't need or which are not of the quality they should be or whatever, they pop up like, a, like a mushrooms in the rain. And a, you should really be able to follow the national guidelines and your own procurement guidelines. And if we think especially about the there are different masks and disinfectants and tests. So we've seen all kind of, of uh, trials to, and the prices have gone to the heavens. Uh, not so badly situation with the medicines, but, but there always try to be some, some unreliable uh, sources. So uh, the, the procurement process has to be, uh, the safety has to be guaranteed. Uh, the same goes with the storage processes. 
so that you know that whatever you are giving to the people, they are of the quality, uh, what we have promised, and they and and the systems are safe, and and the, the um, medicines you are you are selling are are a uh, of good quality. Also, your dispensing processes have to be safe. So you have to support the rational medicine usage, and a especially with the COVID, which sometimes can lead to the hospitalization of the patient, you need to uh, be aware that these people need the medical charge because say, when they are hospitalized, they normally cannot explain what kind of medications they have had. So uh, this is a very important task for the pharmacist to keep up uh, those, those medical charts. Also, your role is to diminish the hoarding and wasting of things. We saw here when, when they, our um, COVID epidemic really started, that people rushed to the pharmacies and they wanted to buy the thermometers, they wanted to buy the, uh, the, the painkillers, and, they, and they, they really wanted to hoard them. So uh, you have to have a dispensing process which guarantees that this is not going to happen. You also need to have rational self-care support because a, a lot of the COVID uh, 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 issue is, a, is self-care. So most of the people are, are managing themselves at home. So the pharmacist's role is very clear here. You have to support the rational self-care. And of course, to support the patient safety so that all these things will go on in the organized way. And what also is very important in the role of the pharmacies is to support of adherence to general pandemic guidelines. So you have your national contingency plan and the national uh, exceptional legislation and people normally get all the information uh, concerning their health from the pharmacies. So you really need to support and be aware of this, say, um, they say, uh, uh, this information so that you can support the adherence to these issues. So these kind of things are the, are the important ones in, uh, in uh, this work. And time to next question. Yes, um, and before we move on with the presentation and Eva will now focus on some examples from, from Finnish pharmacies and, and, and GPP implementation in, in Finland. Uh, but before that, we would like to uh, ask another question. How well prepared was your pharmacy for an emergency like this pandemic? How do you feel that you were prepared for, for, for what happened for this crisis? From, on a scale from one to five, from totally unprepared to five, that you had no problem in facing the crisis and you could respond perfectly well, how would you position yourself? And the results are coming. So the most frequent answer was three. So from one to five, most people, or 39% actually felt that they were um, prepared for the, for the crisis. So not entirely, uh, but, but also there was some degree of preparation that allowed pharmacists to face the, the epidemic and the pandemic um, and the challenges it represented. Eva, back to you. Would you like to comment on this uh, result before we continue with the presentation? No, I think this is a quite expected result and, and even a little bit better possibly than, than they expected. So uh, pharmacies are, are living uh, today, <laughs> to date, I would say. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. So back to you, Eva, with, uh, with the presentation. Yeah. Now we will have a concrete example about the, uh, the Finnish pharmacies responding to COVID-19 and a, uh, so that we can see how to apply this, say, this good pharmacy practice and how did it help us to, to a, manage through the crisis. So what happened in Finland was that our parliament accepted the, the crisis management law uh, or legislation in mid-March, uh, I think it was 15th. And they, that was based on the on the our general contingency plans, as I as I told you, we had those updated 
and we also have a national um, system where we where we storage medicines for six months usage for the whole country and this say this say uh, other uh, kind of equipment what is needed for the in the situation where we could be uh, some problems in in getting more to the country and based on this uh, this crisis management law then our ministry of health and our national agency of medicines gave their own regulation to pharmacy sector and that was about the, there were some exceptions for dispensing rules and there were some uh, wholesaling instructions and preferences so that, for example, some of the medications were reserved only for the, for the hospital usage and the wholesalers were not able to sell them to the open care pharmacies. There was a system to follow up the stocks in the pharmacies, so we sent automatically every week the follow up of, of specific uh, products to our national agency of medicine so that they knew what was happening in the pharmacies and also uh, there was a limitation of the open care usage of hydroxychloroquine and salbutamol and uh, then we also got some extra regulation concerning healthcare personnel and the employer rights were expanded and also the employer responsibilities were expanded so that they uh, we knew a little bit more what we could do uh, during the, the 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 crisis situation, and uh, so that was in the international level what happened. And then on the next slide we have the role of the professional organisations during this uh, crisis. So they gave us and started then to work with the instructions and guidelines. So how to adapt to these general uh, issues. Uh, so there were the uh, plans for, uh, or models for the contingency plans on the pharmacy level. We got the guidelines of extemporaneous disinfectant production. They organized several webinars on COVID-19 and a little bit style on this one, we are here. And they, there were also specific webinars for the employers about how to organize the working conditions and safety. Uh, how the quarantines should go if somebody gets uh, sick in the pharmacy and they, we could have a change the working shifts, we could change many things without asking the employees. And they, then the very important role of the professional organizations is all, also the discussions with officials about the role of the pharmacies and follow up in the national level that how well these roles were fulfilled. And of course, it's the, the crisis is not the time when you when you change your your role then you keep the role you have been given in the contingency plan but uh, you can be well prepared to show your your effectiveness and and uh, your role so that after the crisis we can start discussing for example could we do some vaccinations could we do some other things which could have gone better if there will be the pharmacist involved so that's that's a uh, an important thing and then if we look at the pharmacy level GPP, so in our case, we had our contingency plan from 2017, and that was made for the influenza pandemic, which was a, and, and it was just to keep it out from the shelf and take the dust away. And they look what is say relevant and what is not relevant. And as I said to you, it, it has to be updated all the time. So a, we've updated it, it also after 2017 and now we updated it in March to be adapted into the COVID pandemic. And, and that was very useful because there were all, it was an infl pandemic, it was a virus pandemic. So many of those a, a things which were there were, were totally adaptable in, in this case as, as uh, well. And so we went through all our processes and our standard operational procedures so that we knew how our procurement will be adapted to this. Uh, the cleaning instructions were very important, of course, how to uh, serve the distant customers because uh, it was uh, evident that the people are not able to come physically to the pharmacies. So we have to uh, make our distant uh, services uh, more uh, available. Uh, we had to start producing the disinfectants because they were a shortage in the market. So we, we looked at all our uh, our SOPs on, on extemporaneous production. 
And in normal days, we don't uh, produce anything here. We order everything from another pharmacy. But in this case, we made an exception and we just looked at all our laboratories is up to date, etc. We looked at our marketing plan because we organize a lot of events here in the pharmacy. And now we couldn't do that. So we were looking at that, what kind of, of a uh, informational needs the customer will have, how we will share them, what is the role of, of different people in the pharmacy, etc. And from here, we come to the personal plan. We decided that we are not going to uh, change the opening hours. We are not going to change any vacations or anything else. Or but because we very soon made the analysis that this will not be a long, short run. This will be a marathon, and we have to be aware of this, say, or or be able to to run the pharmacy at least one year under these conditions. So uh, no changes in the in the personal. We just looked at that every role is say clear to everybody. And a, uh, then I will give you some, some pictures about how this looks out in the pharmacy. So here you can see our dashboard. And a, there are the um, uh, decisions from the government. This is the exceptional law and the, all the orders based on, on that. Then we have the local healthcare instructions, both to the customers and to us. And we have our own contingency plan, which was updated sometimes also during the uh, pandemic. And uh, it was here for, for the personnel to see. And then we also printed an A4 and sent it to every customer household into our area where we are located so that they know in which way they can uh, come to the pharmacy and use the distant services, uh, which we do have a lot of, of different uh, types. And they and they so that they could adapt to this. Say, we have a little bit luck when we were sharing this out because it came in the same postage than the, than these a uh, governmental instructions. So we got a little bit prestige on our <laughs> own own documents. Uh, and in the next slide, uh, uh, you can see I was talking about the cleaning instructions, and they of course came to the. Uh, we, we have to effectivize the cleaning very much. And this is just to show the, the, the different colors are for the different rooms. And then we have a two hours list that they, that which places are disinfected and when and who has done it and so on. So normally we do these checkings every day. Now we have to do them every second hour. And they, uh, here in the right side, you can see the representative of a personal. She is protected by a vizier. A, a plastic vizier, which we use when we go to the customer side, and also with the plastic um, or this kind of a, a, a plastic shelter between the, the, the customer servant and the and the customer. Uh, we have a lot of space in the pharmacy, and this makes it easier to keep the customers in their side and and also to keep the safety distances. So we have the order for the for the personnel that they are not able to be in the in uh, in for example eating together more than 10 minutes in the same room so you have to do it in in shifts and here you can also see how our procurement process it's totally automated so these boxes are open when they come to the wholesaler and they are put into the robot who eats them in so we don't need to touch the packages and that's of course also a safety issue uh, but even if you don't have any of these kind of robotic systems, I don't see it's a, any kind of a prevent to, to, to run the, the system. It's the principle which is the most important, that you think about the different processes and you think what can happen there. And then based on this analysis, you then uh, look at the, the, what is needed now during the time of the crisis. In the next slide, you can see our customer information which we then, we have a robot inside. When you come into the pharmacy, he's saying hello to you. His name is Eero. And in this case, Eero is a, was, a, was a showing in his tablet information about COVID, what's actual, what can be done. And here, all the customers take a queuing number and they, they, they all queue with their number and they know how many minutes it will take before they get into the customer service. So there was no need for them to be packed in a line and, and stand very close to each other. This is information about how to clean your hands. 
because still the, 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 this is the most important uh, preventive measure that you do uh, wash your hands and, and have the good personal hygiene. Then we also had these our screens in the pharmacy and in our Facebook and Twitter or wherever we are. We had the facts about the coronavirus and a do you need masks, for example. So that was the information we've tried to give all the time to everybody because that there has been a, a lot of confusion concerning these masks and what is their role and how you could use them or how you couldn't use them. And are they protecting yourself or somebody else or what, what is the idea? We don't have any kind of national uh, recommendation or they are not obligatory, which I think is a very good thing because they are very expensive also. So um, I, I think this is in the, in the right way now. But we've done a, a huge job in trying to inform our customers that these are for single use and they, and they are only protecting the others, not yourself. Because you need to do these FB uh, classified things to protect yourself, and they are not available except for the healthcare personnel. Then this is a typical uh, a certificate which you get with your mask. I was talking about this procurement process. So with this kind of a certificates which come with your masks, you can be sure that you are buying them or purchasing them from a place which you can trust on. We normally use only two wholesalers, so we were buying even these only from those wholesalers. And they have to fulfill the criteria set by, by uh, here in Finland by European Union. But it's very easy to, to falsify these kind of papers. And, it's, and we've seen a lot of uh, examples in the market that this hasn't been so, 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 a, uh, so easy to prevent these, these people to come to the market. So that was our, our role concerning the customer. And, and then in this picture, you can see our distance services. We have the, the mobile pharmacy. So you can call into the pharmacy and you see the customer here in the screen. The pharmacy is talking with the customers and it's like you are physically there, but, but then you can ask to, to this, this is our pick box where you can then pick the medicines after they have been ordered here in this this uh, system. We have, by the way, have ele only electronic prescriptions. So that's the reason why, why you don't need to show them physically. We see them in the pharmacy. We also started to deliver to homes every day. We've had this only twice in the week, but now we have it two times uh, daily. And, and so we could organize the, the home deliveries. And as we can see, the, the, these distance services, our internet sales tenfolded. So from, from a thousand euros in, in a week, they went to 10,000 euros in a, in a week. And what we did in the personal was of course that we moved people from the desk service to these distance services. So looking at this, what happened in the pharmacy, so we could also adapt to the uh, uh, different uh, processes. And a, uh, then, um, I, I think, uh, well, that was the, the thing I, I thought I said. And now I think we had a question. Gonzo. Sorry, I was muted. Um, <laughs> so we, we have the, the following questions, uh, which is, are you going to do a risk analysis and develop a contingency plan for your pharmacy to be better prepared for future risks? based on the principles of the contingency plans that Ava has described, or one that is better suited to your own uh, context and national uh, reality, let's say? Yes or no? It could be for a second wave of this pandemic, or it could be for any future event that could be uh, not related at all to a pandemic, but just to an emergency where we may be uh, forced to implement in, uh, emergency measures. So we now have the results, which is a great result, like 97% of you uh, understand the need and, uh, and the convenience of developing a contingency plan 
uh, for your pharmacy. So back to you, Eva, for the last slides. Yeah, thank you. Yes, so then we will look at a little bit what happened in, in, in Finland. So in this uh, slide, you can see how the pandemic starts in, in the, in the mid-March and the number of new cases went up highly. Now we are almost in the zero and, they, and, and things are, are in this way quite okay. But you could also see that we were very busy in the pharmacy in the beginning and then now we are more in the stable situation but we still need to be very alerted because we cannot trust on that this will go on for forever. And in the next uh, slide, uh, you will see uh, how this, uh, in, in our case, very, very well organized uh, thing, also produced quite good results in the, if we compare with the other Nordic countries. So uh, Finland is here with the red color and you can see that they say the, the cases of the, of the COVID are the, the lowest uh, related to the population. And, and the next one is Estonia. Then we have Norway, uh, uh, Denmark, and unfortunately Sweden uh, got another uh, strategy and they, they wanted to have this uh, herd a, um, protection, but, but that's something we haven't seen in this COVID. So, Unfortunately, they are still uh, having quite high figures of this, say, of, of COVID. So I think that they, with this, say, uh, very systematic approach and, and very uh, well organized system that you have the national contingency plans, you have your own plans, you have the quality management system, you are able to adapt quite quickly to the situation, which is not the normal one. And it helps you enormously to then concentrate on the on your actions instead of me, uh, then starting to think whether I should have a web shop or whether I should set up a, a, a system to measure something because you have all those already on place. So with the last slide, I will talk a few words about the evaluation of the situation. Um, so the quality management system contains the measurements of the results. So we knew, knew exactly how many people were here in which day and what were their wishes and so on. So we could very quickly adapt our personal shifts, for example, for, the, for those times when people are, are coming to the pharmacy. We have every year those kind of development discussions with the personal. We did also this year where I could get the clear picture about whether what is their feeling of the safety about the different issues how well we have succeeded, what other contacts with the customer, etc. And we also got a lot of customer feedback in our uh, social media. And then we have the lead uh, auditing meeting in the, in the beginning of, of June to talk, to, to collect all these uh, results and to see what we have to organize uh, in the different way. So we could make this kind of situational analysis based on these results. So it was fact-based. It was not that I feel that or you have this kind of understanding because we are almost 20 people working in the pharmacy and we all have a different kind of understanding on what happened. But when we have this measured measuring system, it's objective knowledge. It's not so, just something that I feel what happened. And they, then we, after all these discussions, we have all uh, ran uh, again, change a little bit our processes so that they we have the people working in the in the right time uh, when we need them more, and they and we have also learned a lot of lessons. And now what we are trying to do now is to keep the good things, possibly develop some new services or or see that they are more effectively uh, working, and they we are also alerted all the time. And they, I think uh, that's. That's the, the, the good side of this exercise now that, they, that we've seen that this say, quality management system really had given us, and good pharmacy practice has say, given us the tools how to manage in the critical situation in a quite effective way. So thank you. That was my message <laughs> for, for today. And I, I, I'm ready to answer any questions if you have some. So thank you. Back to Gonzo. 
Thank you yeah. very much. Oh, yes. Success you this, in your work. Yeah. <laughs> you had this one final slide. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Eva, for this very engaging and very comprehensive presentation on GPP and how that can, other GPP principles can help us be better prepared for emergencies um, and, uh, in such as this COVID pandemic. We have, first of all, one last poll. Uh, how would you rate this digital event from one to five in, in terms of it, how informative it was? Uh, so one the lowest and high, five being the highest. Um, and in the meantime, I will ask if, if anyone has any other questions for Ava, uh, if you can please use the questions tool. We already have a few questions, so maybe I will read out the first one so that Eva can sort of consider her response already as for one for after we have the results of this one. Um, and the question is, how and who can we accurately identify societal needs? So how can we identify societal, societal needs? What type of indicators do you suggest we use for identifying these needs of the communities and societies we are serving? Uh, yes, I I think uh, this is a discussion between the uh, you yourself in your local level and there with your customers, and then uh, it's a it's a discussion between your your a uh, um, professional organization and the society. So that in the it's it's the best thing if you have some kind of a expectations from the society that why do they have pharmacies? Because sometimes it's not very evident for the societies that they understand that the pharmacies are not just normal shops where you buy some medicines, but there are, are some uh, healthcare goals which has to be uh, reached. And with the help of your pharmacies, you can reach those goals. And in this work, it's very important that your professional organization is able to talk for you what comes to your local level, I think it's very much dependent on, on your demographics around you. If you have mainly old people having chronic diseases, you need to have services to support their medical care with the chronic diseases. If you have young people, the, thing, the situation is different. And then about these services like this, that you have distant customers or you have um, in the... Uh, the people in the pharmacy. So what kind of different needs do these two groups have? So it's a situational analysis where you base your, your a, uh, where you are to who you are going to serve. And then you, you decide that what kind of a, uh, services are, are needed. I hope this answered to some extent to your question. Yes, and also, um... Yeah. I think it does. I think that uh, another source of information that may be used is, for example, the health indicators that WHO mm. provides, and that's freely accessible information. So you can see what what conditions may be more prevalent in your area uh, or your country. Um, and, and also, for example, if you know that the community around you uh, has a lot of uh, migrant population, for example, or has a specific issue with a high prevalence of um, alcoholism, for example, then you may deserve, you want to develop services that meet, meet those, those needs and then develop the whole standard operating procedure to, to assess it. Um, we have another question, which is, how do you suggest that low and middle income countries can adapt uh, and implement GPP standards so for developing countries? Yeah, I, I think it's especially important in, in uh, developing countries because and also with the GPP way you can spare the resources so that you do only those things which are most needed. And in this, the collaboration so that you can use the WHO data and your professional organization and talk to your, your regulators so that what are the expectations to work the pharmacy systems and what you can offer. And then to look at the most important health issues, that how the pharmacist can, can, can help here. And I'm, I'm really of the opinion that, the, the, that even if you have a pharmacy in the middle of the nowhere and you have just two medications there in the shelf, but you need to know that those medications are 
not falsified. They are current. They are kept there in the right uh, temperature, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you can guarantee that the person who comes and pays with the last money he or she possibly has for those medicines that they are really effective towards the the the, the usage. So it's it's extremely important that they exactly that the pharmacies are not doing anything else but but those things which are shown to be effective and 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 that they have a strong role in this on the other hand it also needs to be regulated heavily so the pharmacy cannot be just a business as usual because if you are dependent on the on selling the the all the medicines the people want to have it has nothing to do with the situation that you can uh, help them to use the medicines in the right way. And that's the thing what the society in the end of the day has to understand. Because in, in many cases when the standards of level are higher, the society is paying more and more of the bill of the medicines with the reimbursement system. And this means also that there has to be the controlling system. So I'm a true speaker for the strong regulation uh, concerning the, the pharmacy system. Goncho, you are muted. Yes, I was. Sorry about that. Um, we do have a number of questions that came in through the chat box. Um, for example, my questions that have to deal with the contingency plans for the crisis. You did you did uh, touch upon the, this um, during during your presentation. Is there anything else that you would recommend in terms of developing a contingency plan? Uh, well. I think it's based on the risk analysis so that you really think about what happens if and then you you do the contingency plan place uh, based on this this risk analysis but it's of course a little bit uh, there are some very general parts like a what kind of a um, disinfectants we are going to use or these kind of things but it based it's very much based also on your local um, local needs and, and so on. So it's difficult to, to add in such a detailed information about that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's also a question about precisely about disinfectants and masks uh, and medicine shortages during the pandemic. And how did you deal with, with, with such issues? Uh, for the disinfectants, uh, we were, and the medicine shortages. So um, it was quite easy to expect that they, when people are or, uh, ordered from the uh, parliament to, to go to the pharmacies and buy uh, uh, painkillers. So what we did was that they, we, we ordered them in a, a huge number of them so that we could serve all the customers we had. And what comes to the disinfectants, we could clearly see that whatever we order, it will never be enough. So we started to uh, start our own production. And the problem with the production was that then there was a lack of the bottles and of the bottle uh, box and, and whatever. So uh, it is just kind of uh, thinking about that, uh, how do you, where do you get these things and using a little bit imagination also. So for example, I learned that they, for these uh, electronic cigarettes, they used a glycerol as the as the thing which with things of all this taste to your lung. Can you believe, by the way? And they this so when we couldn't buy the glycerol from the normal wholesalers, you could buy it from this uh, who were selling this these electronic cigarette things, and it was of the pharmacopoeia quality, so it was okay to be used in the disinfectants. So these kind of things. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, maybe I think we have time for one final question. What is your experience on identification and referring patients with COVID-like symptoms? Uh, we are not doing any kind of testing in the pharmacies and I don't think there will be any place for pharmacies testing anything in this respect. 
so whenever we saw anybody who was saying that they have some fever or they have those uh, uh, um, some some kind of a, a reaction, so we we send them to the uh, we have here a local COVID telephone where you had to call. So we sent them there and they and call this number and and then you go go for the tests. The tests were also a bottleneck in the beginning, but then they got um, the system to work. And the, and the testing is now very effective. So everybody who just wants to need to, uh, can be tested. This was also a problem for the pharmacy personnel, by the way, so that even if pharmacy personnel in this country is counted as a healthcare personnel, but it wasn't self-evident that you get into the test. So it was just stay two weeks at home in the quarantine, and then you can, if, if it develops, then you can be tested. If it doesn't, then be there and come back after two weeks. And that was the risk for us, that whether we need to close the whole pharmacy or, or how can we manage. So for that, we needed all these protective things inside the pharmacy so that we don't uh, risk each other. Thank you very much, Eva. Um, I think that uh, we need to bring this webinar to a closure now because it's already uh, time. Uh, yeah. we, do have, we did have more questions than we had time to address them so our apologies that we could not address all the questions uh, but we do invite you to maybe to uh, watch the, the recording of the webinar again you might find some of the answers to uh, your questions there um, also we have uh, the FIP resource center for COVID-19 uh, as I mentioned it's www.fip.org slash coronavirus and this includes the resources that FIP developed for guidance for pharmacists in all practice settings uh, for, corona, uh, for the pandemic, uh, but also a collection of resources developed by our member organizations and other allied organizations that you may find useful and that may address some of the questions that uh, we didn't have enough time to address today in the webinar. So uh, thank you very much. I do invite you to stay um, uh, to pay attention to the webinars and events that FIP will be developing and, and organizing in the coming weeks and months. So do stay tuned and, and we look forward to uh, seeing you at another digital event. Thank you, Eva, very much. And thank everyone thank for, for, uh, for participating in today's webinar. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.